Hi everyone, welcome to this talk entitled Beyond the Four Factors, today with Justin Jacobs, Todd Whitehead and Seth Parnow. My name is Adriar Sangüesa. I'm a PhD fellow at Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and I'm currently working with computer vision and deep learning techniques applied to sports, in particular soccer and basketball. I'm a basketball-based person and I've been coaching for a while now. I've been coaching, for instance, in youth uh, teams of FC Barcelona and I'm also teaching advanced statistics in some courses. Before the content of the talk, I would like to give you some context. So if we go back to March 2020, during the pandemic lockdown, there was like a huge effort made by the Spanish basketball coaching community, and in particular in, in the Twitter community, to create this awareness about the importance of advanced statistics. So there were guys like the Sindicato Nacional de Entrenadores de Baloncesto, clubs such as Mataró, coaches such as uh, David Molins and Pera Purrá, or other companies such as uh, Sport Coach that offer really interesting talks about advanced statistics with guys that know all the theory about it and uh, the awareness was somehow created. Then, uh, this June uh, to October maybe, brand new academical programs emerged like out of the blue about applied data scientists, uh, applied data science and advanced statistics. So we have, for instance, the postgraduate studies about Barca Innovation Hub that they've been working with that for a while now. Uh, that it's together with Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, they are offering some courses about uh, data science applied to sport and analytics. We also have Sports Data Campus that they are offering also some academical contents about uh, specific sports. We have the Spanish Basketball Federation that included some modules of advanced statistics inside uh, their programs. We have companies such as Improved Sports that uh, they started, yes, they the first, uh, well, their first uh, course on advanced statistics. And even we have research groups like the image processing group of Universita Pompeu Fabra that they started hiring people for sports related projects. So it's crystal clear that, uh, well, sports analytics is quite trendy here, but at the moment we have one main issue and it's that we have to compare it somehow to the United States. Here we have this picture that was uploaded to Twitter by Seth a couple of months ago and we have all the uh, data science departments of every single team in the NBA. You can see that that's a lot of hired people that uh, they, their goal is to provide somehow like numerical insights to coaches that can make them potentially win in games. But if we compare it to Spain, for instance, so and I think that this is generalizable to all Europe, we only have one data scientist in all ACEB, that is Francamba in Novradoiro. So somehow we have the awareness, but few opportunities are offered in pro teams. And besides, all the people like in these talks that I was talking about before, I talked in, in, some, in, in some conferences, but we have a lack of experience when teaching or talking. So I cannot talk about concrete examples. I cannot give my opinion on some matters because I don't have, for instance, a five year experience in an MBA team. So coaches at the moment are applying what we teach that is like this rookie data driven pipeline that is first learn the basics. Uh, for example, reading the state of the art basketball on paper book, then learn some equations and apply them like for instance, in a Google spreadsheet for a specific team or club during a long period of time and a posteriori you can extract some conclusions. But somehow this is time consuming and the conclusions uh, come in a long term. So the question here should be, if, is it worth it? Many coaches may be asking this at the moment. Mm -hmm. So only experts can assess if this process is worth it or not. And I don't consider myself an expert because I don't have that experience that we were talking about before. And that's why I brought you today here together. So to get, uh, today we have three top-notch data scientists from United States with MBA experience that will show you how the four factors of Dean Oliver are just the beginning. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. And although these four factors uh, provide like a super solid basis to start with, uh, there's much more than that. And I think that this talk should be like the, the best possible motivation you may have to keep gathering data. I will introduce now the speakers. Let's start with Justin Jacobs, AKA Square 2020. Justin is a PhD statistician and the owner of Square 2020, this, this website. And he brings together 
theoretical math, physics, and statistics concepts to real basketball based scenarios. On this website, you can see a lot of uh, technical reports that every single them is like a scientific paper almost. And even some of them have some open source code, code in Python. Justin has uh, MBA experience in Orlando Magic and Houston Rockets. And I would say that the most remarkable thing in his CV is that he basically works with everything. So he covers a wide spectrum of topics. He can either talk about tracking and post models on top of it. He can use machine learning to classify things and, and perform some predictions and forecasting. He knows the concept of three division and he creates also shiny apps such as running net points. So in today's talk, uh, Justin will talk about uh, building metrics from scratch. Then we have Todd Whitehead, AKA Crumpled uh, Jumper. Todd, you probably have seen his charts in, in Twitter because he displays like super con complex con concepts with effective and understandable visualization. So at the end, no one works with raw data. This raw data is first converted into these visualizations because everything needs to be depicted and then somehow it's communicated in order to make some decisions. So Todd, one of the strengths he has is that he knows how to crunch the numbers. So he has complete understanding of the metrics and then he's able to build these shiny apps that are so valuable in order to get insights. And not only to basketball coaches, but also to uh, basketball fans or just sport fans at the end. In today's presentation, uh, Todd's talk is entitled From Metrics to Helpful Visualizations. Finally, we have Seth Parnow, uh, well, AKA Anchorage Man, that uh, he's like one of the best examples of how to bring research to the pro level. Seth has been the former director of basketball research for Milwaukee Bucks, and he's uh, currently an analyst in The Athletic. And I would define him as an all around communicator. So if you check his name on YouTube or whatsoever, you will see that he has like a lot of talks in many top notch conferences and that the communication flow is super clear. Uh, he has these talks in stats bombs conferences, in MIT sports, uh, MIT Sloan sports analytics conferences. And every single data science team needs a guy like Seth because you may have raw data, like top notch raw data, you may have like clear charts, but if you don't have the guy that uh, talks between analysts and coaches, those insights are lost in the middle. And the best is yet to come uh, from Seth's side because he's writing a book, I think he will tell you afterwards, uh, that should be published in late 2021. Before starting, well, this is uh, the menu for today's talk. Uh, we'll start by creating metrics uh, by Justin. Then we have the visualizations of Todd. And finally, we have the communication of Seth. Uh, we'll have this 20 minutes talk, more or less, and we'll have some five minutes Q&A uh, between all the speakers. And I think that will be really enriching. Before starting, once again, uh, I would like to say just a couple of things. The first one is uh, I want to thank also Jacob Goldstein. Uh, he agreed to be here in this talk. He's the creator of some state-of-the-art impact metrics, and he's super young. Uh, and he was the one projecting all the NBA playoff odds and so on. But uh, a couple of weeks ago or one month ago, he accepted a position in Washington Wizards, Mystics and Go and Go. So just kudos to Jacob Goldstein and also to the Wizards because I, I'm sure they hired a really excellent guy. Also, if you're checking this video and you're soccer based or football based, I don't know how do you want me to say it, uh, you should definitely check Friends of Tracking if you don't know it. Uh, Friends of Tracking uh, also emerged like uh, some months ago and they started uh, creating a lot of content video. Uh, they have GitHub repositories and everything. So I would definitely suggest you to check that out. So that's all by, for, by my side. So let's just start with the presentations. I hope you enjoy them and give some feedback. Thanks. All right, well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Justin Jacobs. Uh, I uh, run Squared 2020 Statistics, and in the past I've worked with a, a couple different MBA teams. Um, and today uh, we're gonna be talking about building metrics through aggression. So the idea here is that we have, uh, we have a, a particular set of questions that we want to answer, and I kind of want to take you through the thought process of what do we need to build up to be able to answer those 
those particular questions and kind of get you in the mind of the, the theoretical framework that we think through uh, from basically the cradle to grave. How do we pose that question into a particular problem? How do we turn that problem into uh, metric? Uh, or metric building, and then how do we test that metric to see if it does anything that we expect it to do? Through some regression type methods. So to start, um, let's just consider a really basic motivating problem, uh, the ball screen. So how do we defend the ball screen? So this is a left-wing ball screen that is occurring between uh, Derek Rose and Willie Hernan Gomez uh, on defense is Glenn Robinson and Al Jefferson. So this is a little dated uh, based on the players and the teams that are here. So you can see Christoph Porzingis on there. Um, so this is from uh, January 23rd, 2017, beginning of the fourth quarter. And what's going to happen here is that Derek Rose is going to bring the ball up court and you're going to get a ball screen that sends the ball towards the center of the court. And the question is, is how do we actually go about screening this or, or defending this ball screen? Um, now, if you, if you pull a random coach from the league, they're going to have a lot of thoughts on how to actually defend this. Then they're going to be revolving around uh, what are the personnel that are on the floor? Uh, what's the type of state of this particular game? What are the strengths of that ball handler? What are the strengths of our defenders? What have we worked on practice over the last few months? What did our five-day scouting report or five-game scouting report suggest? There's going to be a lot of factors that they're going to think through on to determine what type of way they're going to defend this ball screen. So, uh, with some coaches, they'll say, don't let the ball get into the middle. And if that's the case, we would expect the uh, screen defender, um, or the person being screened, which in this case is uh, Glenn Robinson, uh, if we don't want the ball to go in the middle, we want him to go into what's called ice position, which is move himself upward to force uh, Hernan Gomez to screen below him towards the basket. And that would force the ball baseline. And you can kind of corral the ball that way. Um, some coaches don't like players to drive. So if that ball handler is Michael Jordan, you definitely don't want him going baseline because he knows how to create space out of bounds and still make that basket. So you might change your philosophy of how to guard that particular player. Um, but the question is then, all right, if we have different types of ideas of how to solve this problem or approach this problem, how do we go about quantifying each of those aspects to be able to make an intelligent decision? And some of the things that we would uh, start to think, think of when we start breaking down our defense are uh, what are the attack angles of the screen? Because uh, if we're in ice defense or if we're in standard man new ball defense with the rim to our backs, uh, that angle of screen is going to be different in both cases. Also, what are going to be the attack angles that dribble penetration to the rim? Is the player going to go right-handed towards the center of the court, left-handed to the baseline? And then we'd like to be able to understand what are the ramifications of each direction. Uh, similarly, what is the positioning of the on-ball defender? What is the positioning of the screen defender? And as I start to like identify these features, you start to think through the play and you say, okay, there's going to be so some correlations between these. So if the on-ball defender is higher up the court, I'm, you know, I'm in ice defense, my attacking little screen is going to be different. So we're going to start piecing these features together. Uh, included with that, we also want to care about like passing angles. So how would a person pass the ball off? How is the gravity or spacing with respect to the other offensive players or the passing lanes or the driving lanes or even the rebounding lanes if a shot goes up? And these are not an all-inclusive list. We also can include things such as where are the shots going to be created? Um, and we can also identify uh, what type of uh, ways would a player dribble out of a situation. So it's not just dribble penetration to the penetration to the rim. It also might be, uh, does he throw a, a type of action back at the screen man to try and create more space for a back cut? Uh, you know, what are the other types of ideas that we can just think of and quantify? So it's kind of like use your imagination to pick some of these features out. And this is one way to do analysis of just basic feature base. So Here's the next frame that occurs in this screenplay. Uh, Hernan Gomez sets the screen. The ball is going to go to the middle. And what ends up happening on the rest of this play without drawing this out in a bunch of stills is that Derrick Rose is going to get downhill. He's going to pull Al Jefferson towards him. He's going to drop a bounce pass to Hernan Gomez, and Hernan Gomez is going to get fouled for an and one. And the question then is, we did this wrong. We were not unable to protect this play. But where do we make our adjustments or how do we at least quantify this play so we can identify what other adjustments we could make if, if uh, we're missing something else of importance? So in the NBA, what, we, what we'll traditionally rest on is tracking data. So that is just taking the points of these plays and then representing them as dots on a court. 
So this is that exact frame that's moved over into dot representation. And as we view this visually with video, it looks like some of these players are a lot closer than they really are. Like the ball handler versus the guy who's getting screened, it looks like they're about two feet apart. And in reality, they're actually closer to like three and a half, four feet apart. And that kind of makes a little bit of a difference if you're 200% off for the distance between players. So here we have uh, the area of uh, where Al Jefferson's guarding on that left elbow, more in the left high post. And we kind of see how the other players are far off on the weak side, far from the imaginary line that sets the, the separation between strong side and weak side of this court. And some of the questions we might start asking at this point is, is this really a ball screen problem or is this a coverage problem with our weak side? Um, and the answer is maybe, I don't know. So how do we go about measuring some of the effects here? So off this frame, we can start building different types of measures. And here I have um, on the left-hand panel, I have pass vectors. So if I was to throw passes to the players, and we'll just assume for sake of argument that they're just all standstill at this point. Um, if I was to make these passes, which are the green lines, uh, those are my passing lanes effectively. And how close are the defenders to the, those passing lanes? And we would call that passing lane pressure, if you will. Uh, similarly, I have the direct line of sight drive angle. It's kind of an unrealistic angle for the, the point guard or Derrick Rose to drive to the basket. And we might ask ourselves, what type of space is created for that lane? How much pressure is put on that driving lane? On the right-hand side, uh, what we're actually going to see is we're going to see this bend that occurs from, uh, from Derrick Rose as he drives to the hoop. And the question there is, is that how can we disrupt that driving lane in such a way that he can't get to that basket? And we might follow on from that is, is that a really important question? So as you notice, as I'm walking through these, these small measurements that I'm about to build, I keep asking myself, does it matter if we make this measurement and do this test? And when we start constructing these features, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we really care about when we answer our problem, right? Because if I look at a passing lane, in this case, I might be really asking myself, instead of how do I defend this pick and roll, how do I ensure that the basketball goes somewhere else other than the middle? And if you do that, then you've successfully defended the pick and roll. You've got a kick out. And now the question is really, how well do I close out on a player? And when we look at this, uh, the green passing lane going out to the top of the key is now turned into like this cone. And I get this different shaded green. And we can start looking at the amount of pressure that's applied from this defender on that passing lane. And if that player who's about five to 10 feet out from beyond the perimeter, he might not be a very important part of this offensive scheme and he might just be a reset. Um, but now that I've kind of built the geometric lines on that right-hand side, I can focus in on that one weak side defender who's guarding the top and start to build measurements that now is gonna go into how well do I defend this, this pick and roll play. So I can look at his orthogonal distance to the passing lane and that tells me how close he is if that, to that passing lane if the ball is released. And that cone, where he is relative in that cone, that would tell me how much pressure he's actually giving to that line. Because if a player is five feet away from a, from a passing lane and it's one foot from the player who's making the pass, then that's kind of no pressure at all. That means he's on the wrong side of the, path, of the player for the pass. He's not really defending. But if he's five feet away from the pass and the pass is going 20 feet, he's got a pretty good chance of being able to get, get a hand in there for a deflection. Similarly, if we have a driving lane, we can see how far he would have to come to attack that driving lane, which is the blue line going to the up and to the left. And uh, the, right lane, or the right line going down, that blue line going downward, uh, away from the passing lane towards the blue player, his own man, is effectively his closeout distance. And you start to see some quantification of gravity in this case, but we're gonna change that to more of like a pressure identification to see how much he can actually impact this defense. Because ultimately what we're really after at the high level is what can we do differently to stop ourselves from giving up two points, bringing the foul, giving them a chance for three points and potentially putting one of our players on the bench with foul trouble, right? So there's three things we're interested in in answering this uh, at the high level of how well can we defend this. So these are some of the features we're going to extract out. And what we can do is we can go and, you know, uh, war drive through every single thought process and build every single metric under the sun that we think might be potentially helpful. Um, and, and that'd be fine and dandy, but the problem is we're gonna introduce more and more complex complexity into the system. 
Remember when I talked about how the angle of attack for a screen versus the position of the player was on the court as two features I might extract? Well, there's some sort of nonlinear relationship between the two. So the more I rotate a player around an offensive player on defense, the less likely he's going to be screened from the left-hand side versus the right-hand side versus at all. If I take the player and rotate him on the back side, there's no need for a screen. I've got a two-on-one. So I start to capture that uh, through some sort of model in such a way that I don't want to force these actions to happen in the game to view what really happens because it's kind of absurd to say, hey, let's put the defender uh, five feet behind the offensive player and just see what happens. That's kind of a bad take. Um, so what we really want to do is, is we want to try and find the right subset of features. And these features might be explicit, which we, means we've measured them through the physics of the game, or implicit, which means we're using some other type of modeling technique to uncover something that will give us insight, but may not give us interpretability. And we take these features and we have to ask ourselves four things in particular. Uh, do these features help us with our prediction? So if I take these features and I start to look at some sort of response variable, which I haven't defined yet, uh, am I able to recover that response variable meaningfully? Meaning, can I predict it? Can I take an out of sample, look at the different type of action that occurs and be able to predict the action uh, or response that's gonna happen from that collection of actions? And more importantly, do I have interpretability? It might be great that I built this deep learning model or this AI model that is able to predict everything on the court perfectly, but how is that gonna help me learn how to change a prediction? Right. I, I really I don't want to I don't want to be able to predict if I'm going to foul a guy. I want to be able to know when I'm going to foul a guy and how I change it so I no longer foul him. So do my parameters really reflect this game? Do, can I interpret those parameters to say, oh, well, here's how the angle of attack impacts whether or not I foul someone. Here's how I rotate from the weak side that impacts whether or not I foul someone. That type of that type of analysis is much more meaningful on the back end than whether or not I'm going to foul someone. And more importantly, if I op find this through an optimization scheme, is that intelligence that I'm learning through the interpretability actionable? So if I get some response that says, I need to close out from the weak side, is it physically possible for my player? Or am I asking players to teleport? Or am I asking a guy like Muggsy Bogue size, 5'4", to try and be able to rim protect? Those things that might pop up are probably not going to be very helpful in the end. So you have to ask yourself, so while I am able to somewhat predict pretty well and I have pretty good interpretability, are the responses that I get uh, actionable? And then in the end, we have to come back to this question that we keep asking ourselves uh, of, are we even asking the right question? We call this the prognosis stage. So the, the question I'm answering, is it the right question that I'm answering? And is that question that I'm answering the right question to be asking? So when we start some of these problems, uh, uh, what we do is we start with what I call symptoms. So just like you're a doctor, you, you get a series of symptoms and you start to ask what causes the symptoms? What are the underlying, what is the underlying issue that causes this? And we'll start simple. We start with the four factors, right? This is the way that ch the chances end or possessions end. We're looking at effective field goal for scoring, offensive rebounding to continue a possession, to get another chance. Uh, to see when a possession ends with a turnover or get some free throws out of a situation. And we might look at the four factors and say, all right, well, our free throw rate, our opponent free throw rate is too high. And the easiest place to start is let's see where free throw or fouls uh, occur because the way that an opponent gets to the free throw line is through fouling. Uh, so let's go figure out when and where they occur and try and see if there's other symptoms of interest. So, you know, I showed you an Indiana New York Knicks game. Uh, so I went and looked at Indiana's fouls. Uh, throughout the course of a game. And you actually do see some trends that occur and some kind of make sense. Uh, we see a significant jump in the first quarter for when fouls occur. Um, and typically those are bonus situations. So the team's going to get free, the opponent's going to get free throws out of it. But also simultaneously, uh, that's usually roughly around the time when lineups start to change over. So these are traditionally your guys that are either tired from playing a long stint uh, or set a period of time or it's players that have come in fresh and uh, they're not quite up to par of the players that they have to guard because they might be going against starters, uh, or uh, they're just a uh, lower level and just they can't defend as well. So 
we'll see this trend kind of pop up through. The similar trend happens in the third quarter a little bit earlier. Um, that's on par. Then we see the big jump at the end of the fourth quarter. That's usually close games uh, impacting. But we can see here that not all fouls are equal in this case. We see that there's higher foul rates uh, during one part of the game than another part of the game. Um, just for reference here, in case you're looking, the red lines are indicating when the quarters end. Um, but uh, And then you also see the little spike in overtime. So we might have to factor in some form of event of what period in the game and how close the game is. So it might not just be a player-specific situation. So um, we might start learning that it's not really how we defend, but how much pressure we're applying on particular players or how much gravity is coming out. And that's something we're going to have to test later. But what we need to do is, is we have to focus on sequences of events. And while we say, yeah, there's a foul that occurs here, we're more interested in how those fouls occur. So for instance, our, if we use play-by-play, -play, uh, which is accessible at several levels, um, is this coming off of a shooting foul? If it is, then where is the shooting foul occurring? What is the interaction between the fouler and the foulee uh, or the fouled person? Um, is this I'm covering someone I'm not supposed to be covering? So this is a, a person who's been burned on a drive and it's the, it's the rim protector picking up the foul as a last line of defense. Um, or is this the, a guy who just guards his guy a little too tight? Also, is this a foul between a field goal attempt and a rebound? These are the guys that are a little aggressive trying to go for rebounds, the loose ball fouls, if you will. Or is this a foul uh, between a rebound and next event chance? And I say rebound, I really should say end of possession and next chance. Uh, this is looking at those uh, transition fouls, which is why we'll look at time between events. Um, to see if uh, a person is just not that great at, at transition or if they're intentionally trying to foul in transition or is this some, some foul that's occurring in the half court, right? But we don't want to restrict ourselves just to those situations. We want to tease out these situations as indicators. And then we also want to look at every single time that these indicators have occurred throughout a game because we're also interested in when these things, when fouls don't happen because we, we really, we don't want to be limited by the end event that occurs. So some things we might do uh, at, a, at a proxy level, if you will, is to isolate some of the, these fouls based on play action. And this would be like your synergy type databases that exist or a second spectrum when they do some of their markings of, uh, do we look, can we look at pick and rolls and how many fouls are created, uh, dribble handoffs, how many drives that occur. Um, and then we can also look at the tracking if we do have it. And we start measuring things like gravity, ball pressure, passing wing pressure, and so forth. Now, granted, when you go and look at these, you have to realize that there's going to be errors associated with these as well. Because when we develop a model for gravity or a model for ball pressure, it's still a model. There's still noise in there. Um, we have to account that. So if we're starting to make measurements at the, at the decimal scale, uh, we have to be cognizant of how that's going to impact. Um, so let's just tie this all back together. Uh, so we have, um, you know, a bunch of symptoms that we're now interested in, right? So we have a four-factor symptom. There's too many fouls occurring. We have a play-by-play -play symptom. Oh, we're noticing that our fouls are being committed in the half court, right? And these are between post and post players. We have a tagging symptom that's identifying that, hey, we got a discrepancy in pick and rolls in this case. And then we have a tracking system that says, maybe this is something dealing with how the guard attacks a screen. And we're finding that if we, we bend these into these type of events, we see a significant uptick in and one fouls at the post and post level. So we can tether these symptoms together and say, okay, is this a problem now with our, our pick and roll defense and how our guard works? And now we're ready to start asking about that particular model. So we'll take these types of symptoms, we'll extract out the particular features of interest, um, and then we'll start to build that response model. And that model is going to be an out and one foul was committed or not an and one foul be committed. Okay. So uh, just emphasizing it's not only what you do, but also what you do not do. Um, so now we're going to put a response onto the system. Each chance is going to re always result in a score of zero points or more. And therefore, we're interested in modeling the effect of an action. How does my effect, how does how does my measurement of the action on court affect the number of points sco scored? So like for this drive example, if I don't think it's just the guard and I want to include the post defender, uh, here I, I'm interested in whether or not I, uh, I affect his drive angle, the player's drive angle, based on a show, a down, a hedge, a switch, all the different motions that that 
that defender can can perform. And then would that change his trajectory of the drive? Would that change the passing lane between the ball handler and the def- and his teammate who set the screen? And I can put these all together in some. And you're, I think it's the only equation in the entire talk. Uh, we'll put this together into like a design matrix. That's our that's our matrix X. These are going to be some. These are going to be our measurements. These are going to be our metrics. And then this this beta is our weight, and that weight is going to go against our probability of success. And I say probability of success, but uh, success in this case means I've picked up a foul for an So that's that's a it's not really successful in the coach's context, but it's success for for prediction in this case. And here we note that there are 179 and ones for Indiana this season. In the post, it's far less than 179. It's closer to 100. And uh, even then, there's only like 50 that come out of the pick and roll. And these are rounded numbers. So what I'm getting at is these are small amounts. And the number of pick and rolls that occur on the wing is much higher. So these zeros, these none and one plays are going to be very important to help understand what we do right and what we do wrong uh, in our defense. So here I picked a linear model. It's linear because it's beta times X. Uh, I picked the linear model for one particular reason. It's interpretable. If I go and put this into a uh, long short-term memory neural network, or if I put this into some form of deep learning using nonlinear mixers and support vector machines, then I lose interpretability completely. Um, I can gain some interpretability by being able to fuzz the algorithms, which are effectively black box, al- uh, black box algorithms, unless you uh, have spent a decade studying all these things, which most people don't like to do. Um, but I can fuzz them and try and get an idea of what might be useful. But in the end, linear models, they tend to be a little bit weaker uh, than the deep learning, but they have a lot more horsepower when it comes to interpretability and understanding the effects on the game. And what that really leads us to is being able to have some way to communicate actionable intelligence from our coefficients. But where the real work begins is that we don't want to rest on just one hi- one linear model. We really want to rest on a hierarchical modeling. And the hierarchical modeling says, if I have a particular action occurring now, what's the likelihood of the next action occurring? And that the, the what's the likelihood is, am I going to pass next? Am I going to drive next? Am I going to drive this way next? Am I going to shoot? Am I going to box out? There's a lot of actions that you can take, and you have to be able to build these models uh, accordingly. And the challenge you're going to run into there is that we're going to have small samples. Uh, So what we do is we borrow strength. um, And in that case, we might use some form of latent feature analysis. And uh, we just have to keep track of the latent features to try and recover the actual parameters in the standard linear models that we're linking together. Now, this is exactly how neural networks work if we work in a multi-layer perceptron. So in effect, by using this hierarchical modeling, we're doing some form of MLP analysis. But uh, when we try and answer these questions, we are basically stuck to the point of trying to do parameter uh, recovery in this case, which is a fairly difficult problem. But this is kind of the, uh, the thought process we go in for uh, the modeling procedure. How do we test our features? How do we see what's important? Because once we get that test back, it might say that the coefficient for this effect is zero, or we might have a number, say five. And the question is, what does five mean? And in that case, uh, we have to look at the variability. So when you do these models, you just have to remember that these are just mathematical representations of the features, both explicit and latent. And what you really need to do now is you need to be able to translate these parameter sets, this knowledge you've obtained for the mathematical model, and you have to discuss this with the subject matter experts. What is effectively the business decisions that need to be made on the coaching side to be able to put this into actionable intelligence? Uh, Similarly, uh, have feedback and provide a reinforcement learning capability, which means that I might have particular labels that need to be adjusted because we've learned something new about the game. Uh, And then we need to retest all that to make sure that hasn't changed impacts and give us some weird nonsensical uh, responses that can't be attained through physics. And then also we have to, like I said before, uh, understand the importance of variability in our coefficients. Because if I have a number five, and the variability is so large that five is meaningless, then that effectively tells you that that effect doesn't really exist, uh, even though the number looks big. Um, whereas you might have a 0.2, but the variability associated is less than 0.2. And then uh, one thing I learned the very first year I ever worked in the league back in 2013 with a particular Eastern Conference team, um, write your results as if people only read the abstract. So you might get some great results and put it in, in five pages, 
um, but they might only read the one line abstract at the top. And then expect them to never read the abstract and only look at the pictures. And that's usually what ends up happening when we give off diagrams. Like when I worked with one particular coach a couple of years back, uh, we looked at offensive rebounding, how it leads to second chance points. And I had this really nice report. It was three pages in length. It really wasn't that long. It had like its table with a couple of diagrams and explanation of the diagrams. And when I gave it to the coaching staff, I called in the head coach's office. He looked straight at it and he goes, what's this picture? What's that picture? Fantastic. I got everything I need. And he didn't look at any other part of the report. But he was able to put that into action. I was able to have the discussion with him, and we ended up winning the game. We, we actually exploited that pretty nicely and got two turnovers out of those particular situations. And two turnovers was the decision was made. You win a game by five points, and you you know I'll pat myself on the back and say it was good, but who knows? Maybe, maybe they would have fouled with the charge, and you never know after that fact. But we were able to use that for actual intelligence and stop two possessions. So it's a nice thing, um, but that's just one use case. Uh, and... Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I guess, uh, any questions? Okay, thanks for the talk. It's been really nice, appreciate it. Uh, I might start with the questions then, and then we move uh, to Seth and Todd's questions. I will go like pretty fast. So the first one is, uh, imagine you're building, I don't know, not classifier whatsoever. And then you have your hypothesis, and then you check your model, and you see that this hypothesis is not verified. Your first thought is that you can still tweak your classifier in order to make your hypothesis true somehow, or you just discard. I I, I don't know if you got the question. So uh, I would. So the way it's phrased to me, it sounds like we're p hacking at that point. Um, so. I always say start with the hypothesis first, collect your data, and then ask if your data is anything important relative to what your hypothesis is. Um, if it isn't, you throw it away immediately. But if you go and put that into your test and it comes out and gives you controversial answers, it gives you something that go, that's counterintuitive, my question wouldn't be to change something and, and retest it. My question would be uh, to try and identify what part, what component of that model gave you that decision? And try and understand if that was a misspecification that you put into your model. Um, or you might even go as far as saying, okay, what did my data do to that portion of the model? Because I wanna make sure also that I'm not doing garbage in, garbage out. And I might be putting in some noisy data that's just getting captured within that model. Um, but that would be the first places I would look, and then from there start getting really specialized with, you know, what is the real question that we're after, and digging in deep to the context of the information, the information content that's associated with your data. Okay, cool. Then I have another question that's related to tracking data. Uh, you said it still contains noise, like everything, uh, but what noise are we talking about? Are we talking about like some meters differences or? Uh, or are we talking about misdetections or misclassifications of players? What, what's the type of noise that you are handling with tracking data? So that's a that's a great question. Um, so there have been, in, in the years I've been working with this, so some, some data is there's a mislabeling data. So there's been some situations where uh, when, a, when a screen happens, the players will actually switch numbers and you'll lose track of the players. Those are very rare. Um, actually, dealing with one of those components right now with a model because it spit back something bad, um, and it literally just swapped the players. So that that just tells me that the um, AI tracker that that's that they're using on the video footage, um, it just hit a, a boundary case. Uh, the bigger problem that you really run into is what I term as skips. So it's when uh, a particular player is on the court and then they magically zoom off the court and then pop right back on. Um, and this happens when their classification algorithm loses track of that particular player somehow, because sometimes a guy's off on his own. I don't know why it happens this way, but I remember there was uh, one particular game where Kevin Love was the, was the player in, in, in uh, question. Uh, during a 30 second snippet, he spent about 75% of the time uh, in the, uh, on the bench. So he would be setting a screen on the bench, and then you'd see the ball go around the screen, but there'd be no Kevin Love, and they'd zip back right to where he was. And 
Uh, we don't know if it's like, if there was an artifact in the video that caused it. Um, so our, our thing to solve that was uh, just apply a, a common filter and impute what his position would have been. Um, other groups just said, you know, I just dumped the frame. Who cares? We have so many other screens that occur. Um, and uh, the other error is um, the video is picking up on the center of mass of a player and center of mass is kind of, it's, it's a little wonky. So you'll see a player who's standing in the lane, but their dot will be outside the lane on occasion. And then you realize that the angle of the, of the cameras that are picking him up will we'll kind of hone in on the fact that he's more wide than tall. So some of these players will be sitting just inside the big block, like the bottom block on the, on the lane. Um, but you'll, I mean, you'll see the video and you'll see the guy there in the lane, but you'll see the guy two feet away on, as a dot. Um, so if you start training on that particular position, uh, not taking into account, like the average error for a player of, of notice is like somewhere around a foot and a half. Um, but you have to remember the players are approximately three feet wide. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a little dithering in, in the, in the position estimate of a player, but those are a couple of the common errors that I'll see. And when I say common, like they happen enough that, uh, annoy you, but, um, for the most part, tracking data is, is, is fairly stable. Just, just note that if you get coefficients that are, uh, indicating half foot, resolution and the variability from the model is like quarter foot. So half foot is meaningful. You really should be specifying measurement and error on top of it and doing some sort of Bayesian hierarchical modeling. Great. So uh, what's your take on post data? Will it improve I'm post? Like when applying, like I, I saw some of your tweets that you were applying open post models in order to check more advanced things. And I think it can correct somehow uh, tracking data and at least you can make it more meaningful because you have like all the posts of the player uh, itself and you know where he or she expands like arms and everything. Do you think that this will improve the tracking data existing one? Um, improving tracking data? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I play around with the pose data. So I've used pose data to try and recover tracking points on video and there's people who, who do it way better than me. So um, Oh, good Lord. What's his name? Neil Johnson, I think from ESPN did a, po did a talk about this at Sloan and he did, he did a fantastic job with it. Um, and I would, I would completely defer to him for being the expert for that. Um, so I don't know if it would improve tracking. It would help us identify tracking in some games, but also I've applied this to, um, older footage. Uh, and if you notice like the folks, uh, who created this originally, uh, when they did their demo a couple of years ago at Sloan, a lot of the players disappeared off their court. And that was like their good use case. Um, so they gave the Oregon Ducks example. Um, and they had three out of five players on the court. And the other two, you could see them. You could see them very plain as day, but they weren't on their tracking data. They, their dots were gone. Um, so there's still some issues there. And uh, what I've really focused on more with pose data is to say, uh, if I want to look at a particular action, let's let's pick a player who is uh, meaningless for this year. So let's say uh, I wanted to look at when Dirk Nowitzki was going to go and do his particular step back. Um, I'm more interested in what's the mechanics for how he's going to move his arms through the, the shooter's pocket to be able to get free to get that shot off. Is he going to do a swinging motion? Does he keep one arm higher than the other? You know, try and pick up on little noticeable ticks because if I got a guy with with just – fantastic clog or glove hands, you know, I want to be able to help him identify, here's the tick of what this guy is going to do. How can we pick up on that tick and be able to get your hand in that pocket so that we're not driving up fouls, but disrupting the shot so much that he can't get into his normal rhythm. So that's what we're more interested in with the pose data. Um, and the point I was making was with that talk with the Oregon stuff, when you try and apply it back to like eighties footage, um, eighties footage actually has a different camera angle. And um, a lot of the camera angles don't aren't necessarily sidelined down. They're actually like angled um, to the ed edge of the court and downward. So you'll get a different degree of, of positioning. And uh, the open pose will pick up players, but the where the locations where those arms will be relative to where the court is isn't quite where you expect them to be. Awesome. Thanks. 
Uh, I don't know, Seth, Todd, if you want to ask something. I was curious, Justin, um, if you were talking about doing a model to kind of predict where you might foul, and I was wondering if you had the occasion to include referee information in those kind of models as well. No, I haven't. Um, there is, uh, I mean, there is a database of referee actions that occur. Um, I mean, you can get all the referee calls through uh, NBA stats. Um, you can even get all the challenges and everything there as well. Um, so you know where the what the calls are, but you don't know. Um, the play, right? They have all the the labels of the referees. Um, what you don't necessarily have access to immediately is the location of the referee when they make a call. You do get that in the tracking data, um, but uh, haven't tried incorporating it into a model. Um, I know there's been reports about how certain teams like to write reports about how referees are are uh, calling calls against their teams. I like to stay out of that noise. So I usually don't incorporate the referee. I treat them as an autonomous machine. They're going to make the call when they make the calls. And then generally when I have looked at things, I haven't really seen a big uptick with how referees call games. Um, maybe there's some perceived things, but um, I usually I usually keep that out. I, I would hate to tell a coach, hey, worry about this ref and how they're going to call this particular play. In high school, yeah, definitely. <laughs> like the high school level, man, when I coached high school, I couldn't stand half the refs but because I knew exactly what they were going to do because I was positioned. At the pro level, they're a lot more professional. So my, my question to you, and this is something we've talked about kind of offline before, is um, there's a lot of, certainly in, in the model that you're building, there's a lot of, I would say more categorical features rather than 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 continuous, but the the decisions a player is make makes on a basketball court are are more, you know, there, there's an unlimited series of possible things they could they could possibly do. Um, it's it, it, it's a dreaded talk about question, but just you, if you had any thoughts about how to reduce the complexity of that, so you you actually get to the point where all right, he could drive past here here or here, or he could drive at this angle or, or just to kind of reduce those to a manageable kind of set of decisions you can evaluate. Yeah. I, you know, I, I hate that question. I love it at the same time um, because you're absolutely right with the, the way, the way that we present that type of model is we, we can end up with infinitely many features and, you know, then, then we're just modeling noise at that point. It's faces and clouds. Um, there are some folks who have uh, attempted to build machine learning models to capture the decision-making process. One example is the expected point value stuff that Dan Servone and, and companies made. Um, there's some, there's several issues with it, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic attempt to try and understand like what's the likelihood that a player is going to pass. And it might be at that level to try and build not just a, hey, they're going to pass, but try and build some sort of continuous type metric to say, here's some, here's some probability angle vector and try and cook it to two or three features. Um, but it's, it's such a challenge because, um, and I think it's really comes down to the amount of noise that's in the system. And when I say noise, I mean, we don't have enough samples to tease out those distributions. So however, like in the, in the uh, EPA, EPV problem, what they do is they do the non-negative matrix factorizations at every single decision-making process. So they'll say, I'm going to make a pass. I have an indicator feature for that pass, but here's the underlying non-negative matrix factorization. So I got a bunch of spatial graphs and a weighted set of spatial graphs of where those passes would likely go. And they're trying to learn the coefficients of those graphs. So they're basically trying to take the, uh, if we say our cord has been by one by one foot by one foot bends, the 47 times 50 for the half court number of features are now reduced down to 10. And that's one way to try and reduce the modeling space. Um, but the challenge we end up there is, is that in the latent feature space, we're starting to remove ourselves from interpretability. Like what does it really mean to pass to that latent feature set? And that's where it becomes like, I hate this question because I can't communicate that to a coach. I can't say he's passing the spatial basis number eight, which is kind of in this general area. He's going to be like, well, I have five players over here. What the hell makes you think I'm going to pass to this location? 
Like this, this is not helpful to me. I'm more interested in, um, is he going to look in this direction and how do I model that? Sorry, we, I'm sure Seth and I can talk hours for this this particular problem because it's, it's, it's super, it's exceptionally important for uh, coaches. And, and we have. And we have, yes. That's great, that's great. It was a great question indeed. Uh, perfect, so we might uh, switch to Todd's uh, presentation. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about, I guess the second of the three steps in the process today, how we go from having these models and these metrics of what's going on in the court to sort of visualizing that information in a useful way. And uh, the tagline that I try to live by is sort of communicating complex basketball ideas in a, in a simple way. Um, so I write for Nylon Calculus. Um, I don't have as much experience in the league as these other two distinguished speakers, um, but I uh, have done a few projects with teams and I'm, I'm trying to do more. Um, so I'm gonna start off with kind of a quiz question for all the coaches out there. So this is a real Denver Nugget lineup from the 2019-20 season, um, some of their real stats. So this particular lineup scored 48 points, allowed 37. They were on the court together for 29 offensive possessions. And all in all, they played just 14 minutes together, and it all came in a single game. Um, their net rating, if you want to calculate it this way, was a plus 38 points per 100 possession rating. So the question that I'm asking you is, is this a good lineup? And, and that's sort of a, a data question, um, but it's also uh, more than just a theoretical question. It's a, a question that leads to real decisions about investment, right? So as coaches, you need to decide, is this lineup worth playing time or at least some time to experiment together on the court? So that gets into questions of whether we wanna give them, you know, real playing time in high leverage situations and clutch situations where the game's on the line, or if we just wanna try them together in, in a game to sort of see if they're gonna work well in the future or in the playoffs, for example, not just on the court, but also in practice. Do we want to give these guys a chance to sort of mesh and really get a little more cohesive? Obviously, both of those issues have an opportunity cost, right? So if we're playing this lineup in the game, we're not playing some other lineup. Or if we're giving this lineup practice time together and we're taking it away from some other lineup that might get less cohesive because of it, do we want to create dedicated plays for this lineup or think about sets that are going to make them work better together? Are we going to invest our time in creating that kind of infrastructure to support them? Or do we want to even go as far as changing the trajectory of their skill development so that we say, okay, this guy is really more of a wing, but in this lineup, he's going to be the primary ball handler. So do we need to give him more time developing those primary ball handler skills? These are all real investment issues, and it's hard to do that um, in the example that I gave you before. You might even have to go so far as shuffling around a rotation, right? So that not only are you adding this new lineup, but you might have to find new combinations with other players because the rotation has changed. And that's a challenge as well. And, and those are all kind of coaching questions, but there's also sort of a more personnel question of whether we want to invest in these guys uh, as, as players long-term on our team. Do we want to resign them? Do we want to give them their options? Do we want to extend them? Do we want to open them up to trades or we'll allow them to walk in free agency? Um, those aren't necessarily decisions that the coach is going to be able to make, but hopefully he would have some input on it at least. So if we see something interesting as in terms of a combination or a lineup from guys who are kind of buried right now uh, in our rotation, do we then change our thinking about how we want to invest in them financially um, in the future? All right. So going back to this first lineup that I sort of teased with in the opening, um, we saw that it had a plus 38 net rating. But if I told you that the lineup was made up of two centers and three guys who were six foot 10 or more and that there was no true point guard in the lineup, then what are you feeling about it? Do you think it's a good lineup? Would you want to make all those kinds of investments in it if you know those kinds of generic descriptions of the players who are in the lineup? Do you think that it's going to work well in the future? Well, this is the lineup that it actually was. 
Uh, it was Jokic paired with Plumley, which is kind of a odd pairing. Obviously, the Nuggets don't go with that a ton. It's a two center lineup. Um, and then they have a third tall player in Michael Porter Jr., who's not super fluid defensively on the perimeter. Um, and then Will Barton and Malik Beasley um, with no true point guard in the group to really um, bring the ball up unless you want to give it to Jokic. Um, and, and what's what's happened to this group since that lineup played its uh, 14 minutes together in that that one game last year? Well, Beasley was was traded, obviously, and Plumlee walked in free agency. So um, it did not appear that the Nuggets found this to be an enticing enough combination of players that they wanted to move forward and invest in it in all the ways that we talked about before. Um, so the basic problem that this sort of example highlights is a common problem when you try to deal with lineup data. Um, and the issue basically is that any combination of five players is going to tend to have a pretty limited number of minutes, even over the course of a season, even in the case of really common lineups, like you're starting five because there are injuries and because guys are getting rested, there's always going to be, um, reshuffling of those five man combinations and reasons to prevent you from gathering a lot of data about any particular combination of players. Um, so you could think of a lot of different reasons why having a small sample size, as we might call it in the data world, um, is problematic for drawing conclusions. Um, so you could say like maybe the opponent quality was uh, unique somehow that they were playing either a really tough matchup or a really easy matchup in those limited number of minutes, or they were playing during garbage time when the motivation of the other team was very low, or they were playing somebody who was coming off of a uh, long traveling trip and they didn't have the usual amount of energy that they would in terms of the opponent. Or there might just be some lucky shooting or like a hot streak that went into that um, particular collection of data that makes it somehow unrepresentative of that potential of that group in the future. Um, and the, the bottom line of all of this is that if you don't have a sufficiently large sample size, you can't be predictive about how things are going to go in the, in the future. And that's really what you want to do, as, as Justin was talking about in his talk. You want to be able to say, OK, how can I use this information in a way that we can do something better next time? Um, so one potential workaround for this uh, is something that I had been toying around with this year, um, which is basically to combine a group of similar lineups together and then look at how all of those similar lineups have performed to sort of consolidate the information across these similar situations from different teams around the league. And then say, okay, when I have a combination that looks like this in terms of you know, two centers, a third tall guy, and then two wings, when I look at all the times when that kind of a lineup has been used, across the league, does it generally work well or not? Is this a good combination of types of players or not? Um, and, and then we can kind of use or borrow that information from these other scenarios, these other teams, and then use that information to sort of inform our decision-making process or at least speed it up a little bit. Um, so that's when you're gonna turn to this app that I've created, which is this similar lineup binder app, which currently only has NBA data, but could be used in other contexts as well. And this is the way that the app works. And we're going to get to sort of like the fun visualization part of this in a second. So um, as a way to kind of make the visualization aspect of the app a little bit more intuitive, um, the system is set up so that it uses the red, green, blue color system that you would see like when you're picking a color in Excel or PowerPoint, when you have that kind of um, matrix of combinations of the red, green, and blue, and they can kind of form any color in the rainbow. Um, and what it does essentially is it starts with the assumption that there are these three player attributes that are kind of important in defining the way that a, a player is, is playing or the type of player that they are in a particular lineup. So these three um, attributes that I'm going to use are offensive creation using Ben Taylor's offensive load statistic. So that's kind of a usage stat that's more holistic. So it's not only looking at field goal attempts, but also bringing in like assists, 
passing, even a little bit of gravity um, through three-point shooting um, in order to get a sense for how many plays per 100 possessions uh, a particular player had a meaningful contribution to. So um, they were really having an impact on a particular possession. Um, so for like a really high usage player like Russell Westbrook um, in 2017, for example, you could have loads that were above 50%. Um, and then like a, a more limited kind of um, off the ball kind of player would be kind of in that 20% or lower range. Um, and then the second sort of key attribute that I looked at was the floor spacing, which I used a simple surrogate for uh, just looking at how many three-point attempts they were willing to shoot uh, per 100 possessions. And then the last one was the rim protection or sort of the willingness to stand near the rim on defense, basically. So how many field goal attempts were defended inside of six feet per 100 defensive possessions when the player was on the court? Um, so you get these three key sort of components of a player's profile, how much they're creating an offense, how much they're willing to shoot threes, and how much they're standing near the rim to protect the rim on defense. And each one of these things is going to be on a per 100 basis. And then each one of these things is going to look at how often the player tried to do these things, not how well. So they're not measures of skill. They're just measures of what a player is being tasked to do on the court. Um, and then in each case, we'll look at the percentiles across the league um, in order to get our different color combinations and then um, combine red for offensive creation, green for floor spacing, and blue for rim protection to get our characteristic color for each one of the different types of players. And then what you can do is basically look across the league and find comparable combinations of players, uh, types of players in lineups, and then find the lineups that are most similar to the lineup that you're evaluating, like the Nuggets lineup that played 14 minutes together. Um, so when you plot out these three um, attributes um, as a three-dimensional space, it creates this kind of a picture where what you're looking at is uh, a block of space. And hopefully it's a little bit confusing because I brought some props and I'm going to um, show you a different way of looking at this. But um, essentially the three axes are those three attributes, offensive creation, floor spacing, and rim protection with the different colors combining to show us certain types of players. Uh, I created a couple of physical sort of representations of the player space. So you can kind of see how it works in a 3D way rather than try to conceptualize it on, on a screen. Um, so this is a Lego version of it. Um, and again, the idea is that red is representing offensive creation, green, floor spacing or three-point shooting, and blue rim protection. So what ends up happening is in each one of the sort of extremes at the corners of the cube, you get one of those combinations. So in the red corner of the cube, for example, you have the guys who, like Ben Simmons, create a lot on offense, don't shoot any threes, and don't really protect the rim. If you go up uh, to this corner, you get the guys in the blue who are doing the rim protection, without the shooting or the offensive creation. So that might be somebody like Clint Capella. In the green corner, you have somebody like Duncan Robinson, who's shooting a ton of threes for each possession that he's out there, um, but he's not protecting the rim as a perimeter player, uh, and he's not really creating offense for others. And then there's the combinations of all these things around the cube, right? So if we look at this side of the cube, that's essentially all the players who are willing to create on offense. Um, so the red guys, again, are the ones who are only creating. The yellow guys are the ones who have red and green. So they're creating and they're shooting threes. The purple guys are the ones who are creating or protecting the rim. So they're red and blue. And then white in this corner are the guys who are doing everything. So that's like your, your unicorns, right? Like Chris Aperzingas. Um, if you look at it from a different angle, like the top of the cube, then you could say, this is all the guys who are protecting the rim. Guys in this corner in the blue are just protecting the rim. Guys in the white are protecting the rim, spacing and creating. The purple corner, they're protecting the rim and creating. And the teal, which is sort of uh, 
a not frequently inhabited corner of this player space are the guys who are not creating, but they are shooting threes and they're protecting the rim. So the thing that's kind of a little bit um, misleading about this is that the cube looks like a monolith, right? Like it seems like there's players everywhere. Actually, it's more like Swiss cheese, right? Where there's pockets of players that are doing similar things in certain parts of this player space, but then there's voids where there's nobody like that, not combining any of these certain skills in, in that particular way. So like I said, the teal corner is pretty empty. It's got Brooke Lopez, um, but there's not a ton of players up there. Um, and then you have this black corner over here, which is the, the corner of guys who are not doing any of these things. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not useful in some way. And we'll talk later about what the app is sort of leaving out, but uh, it's guys like Rodney Magruder who are like not shooting, not defending the rim and not creating. There, there are other players who are playing wing positions or power forward positions, but not doing any of those three things. Um, so that's the idea of the space. Uh, the trick, of course, is aside from the fact that it's not a solid space, um, it's also a three-dimensional space with points inside, right? So this is showing colors on the, the surface, right, of the cube. But actually, there's different colors inside of the cube. There's a bunch of brown in the middle of the cube of these guys who kind of do a little bit of everything, uh, and they might be important too. So I tried, and we'll see if it stayed um, in solid form to create a different version of this where you can look inside of it. So this uh, is basically like a little ice cube with the players inside of it. So again, you have the, uh, the green corner here with our, these are our just shooters, red where we're just doing offensive creation, and then yellow where, where we're doing spacing and creating. Uh, and you can kind of see how if you look through the middle of it, there's other people in there, right, on the inside of the cube. So you don't see that when you're thinking of the Lego um, block, but they're, they are in there. Uh, so one last version of this where we can see some actual names. This is like the player space as a cardboard box with little flags for each one of the different actual players. Um, and again, there's players on the inside of the square who like Tobias Harris could do a bunch of different things a little bit, um, but they're not as fun to look at and they don't have um, pins that you can find as easily in the store. Um, so like in the block, our offensive creation is increasing this way and our rim protection is increasing this way. So in this corner, we have our red guys as well as our yellow guys. So that could be like Jimmy Butler, Ben Simmons, Russell Westbrook, DeMar DeRozan, right? Those guys who are creating a lot, but they're not necessarily shooting threes. Go up on the rim protection axes to the top corner, and you find these guys who can both create and protect the rim, right? So you got Jaron Jackson, Kevin Love. Again, this isn't not necessarily saying that they can protect the rim well, but that they are frequently standing near the basket on defense. A blue corner here with our guys who are protecting the rim but not doing much else. All right, so we have this kind of space, this physical space that we're going to use to define types of players. Okay, so what the app wants to do is you feed it one particular lineup. And it could be a real lineup from your team, like in the Nuggets example, or it could be a imaginary lineup, a aspirational lineup that you want to try out. And what it's going to try to do is test all the other lineups that have been played across the league and try to figure out where in that Lego cube or in that cardboard box the players that you have are located and then how far across that cube or that cardboard box you have to go to find a matching player in whatever lineup you're comparing your lineup to. So it's gonna evaluate the whole universe of lineups 
that have been played in the NBA with the caveat that it's only going to look at lineups that have played at least 20 minutes together or 20 possessions together, excuse me. Um, and it's going to try to link up the five players that you put in with five similar types of players from any other lineup that's been used. So in this example here, this is not the, the same lineup from the Nuggets, but it's another lineup that's kind of similar um, to the one we talked about before. And it's, it's pairing up this lineup from the Nuggets with one from the Sixers that it feels like is, uh, contains similar types of players, players who are located closely in that player space to the ones that we've input. So it matches up Joel Embiid with Nikola Jokic, for example. Those two spots are very close together in the player space because both of those guys are doing a lot of rim protection and a lot of offensive creation with a little bit of floor spacing. So they get in that sort of pink hue. And it's going to link up Al Horford with Paul Millsap because it sees those players as doing similar amounts of these three attributes as well. So it's trying to minimize the distance between the players that we put in and any possible players that it's going to check from other lineups uh, across that space. And um, it checks all the combinations of different players within the lineup. So it's going to check Jamal Murray versus Shake Milton, but it's also going to check Jamal Murray versus Tobias Harris and Jamal Murray versus Joel Embiid. And then it picks the ones that minimize the distance across all five of the combinations of pairs of players. Um, and then it spits out which are the most similar lineups. So in the app, this is what you see. You put in our, our five player lineup. So going back to our original lineup from the beginning there, Malik Beasley, Will Barton, Michael Porter Jr., Mason Plumlee, and Nikola Jokic. Uh, those are the guys that, that we had from our sort of interesting lineup that had a small number of minutes last year. And we want to say ourselves, okay, we know it worked well for us in those particular minutes, but do we think it will work well more generally if we tried it again? Does it seem to be working well for others to use this combination of types of players? Um, and, and, and what you have here in the first view is sort of a table that allows you to scroll through the 50 lineups that are most similar to the lineup that we entered. And there's a checkbox to either include or exclude lineups from your own team. So that could be useful in different ways. You could be using it to try to think of new combinations within your own team to try, or you could be thinking about um, how well it's working outside of your team for other players. Um, so this is uh, sorted by similarity score with the most similar lineups at the top, and you can scroll through the five pages to see the top 50 lineups. Um, so it's coming up with, as we saw on the previous page, some of these uh, Sixers lineups with uh, a lot of big guys in them, as well as some of the Warriors lineups that they were experimenting with last year. Um, and, and this is sort of the color coding that we saw in the Lego square or with the pins on the cardboard box where each one of the players is sort of defined by this characteristic color, which is a combination of the three attributes that we think are most, or we're going to pretend for now to be most important um, for defining what kind of player somebody is. So again, Jokic has a lot of the red because he creates, he's got the blue because he protects which you put together and you get sort of this purplish color. Um, and you can kind of look quickly across the top 10 matched lineups and say, okay, where do the colors look up? At, where do the colors look like they line up really nicely, like between Jokic and Embiid, for example? And where do they sort of not match up perfectly, like Jokic and PJ Washington, for example, where the app has sort of forced these guys to be a match because they're making it as close as possible. Um, or like Mason Plumley matches up pretty nicely with Tristan Thompson in terms of the color or Cody Zeller, but he's probably pretty different from Ben Simmons, for example. Um, but at any rate, the idea of this is that you can sort of visualize the types of different players um, based on their sort of representative colors um, and then sort of think about how well they match up with these comp lineups that we're picking out and see, okay, if we wanted to add in somebody who could throw in a little bit more green to this lineup, for example, how would that change um, the comps? And then what do those comps look like? How well are they performing? So the next tab sort of summarizes the performance of those similar lineups. So lineups that have five players who are, are a similar type of player to the lineup that we put in, how do those 50 lineups perform when they played together um, in the NBA last year? 
So it provides you the offensive and the defensive ratings. And in the text, you also get the net ratings. And it sort of def defines it in these four quadrants of being either good or bad at offense or defense, which is just relative to the league average. Um, and you can see in this particular case, um, as you might have expected, based on sort of the wonky combination of player types, um, the comp lineups haven't performed super well. So they have a median or typical net rating of minus 6.8 points per 100 possessions. So they're getting outscored by their opponents typically by about seven points per 100 possessions. Um, that's particularly bad when you think that we're only looking at the lineups who played 20 possessions together. Um, so you're already sort of biasing your sample to look at a better group of lineups and th these are still performing pretty terribly. Um, and you can see that the two components in the text are an offensive rating, typical offensive rating of 106 and a defensive rating of 113. So they're worse than average on defense, but they're really the place where they're losing out is on offense, which you would expect with all of these, um, the, the double center kind of look. And it's color coded. So you can see that the red lineups are the ones that are bad. You see a lot of red dots and the blue ones are the ones that are good. You don't see enough of those blue dots to be sort of optimistic that this would be a combination that we would expect to work well if we went with it and gave it more minutes in the future. Um, and the size of the dots here are just indicating how often these team, how often these lineups play together. So there's quite a few of these pretty large red dots and a very small number of very small blue dots to be sort of thinking that this might be able to work. And then the last tab that I'll show you is this fit tab. Um, and the idea of the fit tab is basically to compare on the horizontal axis, the average impact of the players in the lineups multiplied by five. And then on the, the vertical axis, the net rating of that lineup. So it's asking, do these lineups have more than the sum of their parts or are they not optimizing the collection of players because there's a bad fit? And in this case, there's a bad fit. So the typical comparison between the average impact of the player in the lineup and the net rating of that lineup is minus 2.5 points per 100 possessions. So they're underachieving relative to the quality of the player in the lineup. The fit of the lineup is causing these players to interact poorly together, and they're actually achieving less than they would in potentially other combinations. So this particular part of it would be able to sort of separate out, okay, not only were these lineups bad because the players in them were bad, but they were bad because they're it's a bad idea to combine players in this way. Okay, so that's what the app is, is trying to do, but there's a lot that the app doesn't do as well. Um, it doesn't match directly on height, and it doesn't incorporate anything about perimeter defense uh, into the matching either. You could probably think of several other attributes of a player that you would want to include in addition to height and defense and the three things that we're already including, which are offensive load, three-point shooting rate, and rate of protection at the rim that you would probably think are valuable measures of a player. Um, but the reason why I wanted to have three items going into this was so that I could have this color-coded visual scheme to kind of make it more interesting to look at. Um, so that would be kind of a starting place, and then you could build it out from there and make it more nuanced. Um, the app is also not measuring skill level at all. It's only measuring the frequency with which players do all of these different activities on the court. So usually in the NBA, that's tied pretty closely to their skill level because guys don't get a chance to do things that they're not good at. But um, there certainly would be a range of how skilled these lineups are. Um, another thing that the app doesn't do is anticipate how players are going to develop in the future. It's basing it on the current 2019-20 data and not trying to have any sort of um, sort of like aging curve built into it. And the big thing is that it doesn't know anything specific about your team. So like if we look at, for example, the Lakers in the Samora lineup finder, a lot of their lineups come up looking very bad. Uh, the lineup app doesn't like the fit that they had in many of their lineups last year. And uh, that's just sort of, I think, a function of 
how special and unique LeBron and AD were playing together um, in a way that other teams couldn't replicate if they tried to combine similar types of players. So if you have somehow a player that is in a particular archetype, but is somehow unique for that archetype, um, you might have to adjust what you find from uh, this kind of consolidation of lineup information across the league. Um, so here's what the app hopefully can do for coaches specifically. So the idea is that it would suggest good combos of, of types of players that you would want to try to put together. Um, take those kinds of lessons from across the league and then allow you to apply it to your specific team context. Um, it would kind of generate ideas for you to try out if you were willing to experiment with new combinations. Um, it would help you optimize your rotations so that you're putting together the combinations of players that get the most out of each other and then sort of making the most of all the players that you have on your roster. Um, and it would allow you to make lineup experiments more efficient. So you're not wasting your time trying out new lineups that probably aren't going to work very well. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of front office stuff that hopefully the app could do as well, like evaluate how free agents would fit into a team or a new draft pick, or to think about how a trade might improve the fit of a lineup or that kind of thing. Um, again, the coach would have some involvement in that too, hopefully, uh, but that's not probably a uh, coach's principal concern. Um, so finally, we'll go back to the app one time and kind of say, all right, so if we wanted to look at some other combination of nuggets, that would be a more natural fit uh, according to what has worked well around the league last year. We might say that this would be a lineup that would work well. So this is kind of like their starters basically, but incorporating one of the new players this year, Jermichael Green. Um, so if you went with Jokic, Murray, Barton, Harris, and Green, the similar lineups from around the league had a typical net rating of plus 12.3 points per 100 possession, which is really on the high end of the scale for the lineups that I've looked at in the app. So that would be like a really good fit. And it's several points per 100 possession above what you would expect based on the quality of the players in those 50 similar lineups from around the league. Um, so I'll just close with some kind of general points about making visuals and hopefully I, I accomplish some of these things in the presentation, but um, I try to think about different types of learners when I'm making visuals. Um, so incorporating tables and texts and figures and trying to combine all those things together in a way that can help people who learn in any of those different ways or get information in any of those different ways more easily. Um, so I think that's one thing that works for me as a person who's trying to communicate basketball information to coaches or front office people. But I think it could also work for coaches who want to communicate information themselves to their players or to other people in the organization as well. Um, another tip I think that I try to incorporate in what I'm doing is to be compelling and engaging as a way to sort of encourage stakeholders to buy in. So again, for me, that's trying to encourage the coaches to buy in, to encourage you guys to buy into what I'm showing you today. Um, but I think that it could also work for coaches trying to get the players to buy in. So thinking of outside the box ways of visualizing things that make them more interesting or more approachable is one way to kind of get people interested. And then you can try to get them to buy in with the, the sort of messages that you're trying to convey. Um, and a big part of, I think, doing this successfully is to try to get feedback and then make improvements. So did this stuff resonate with the people that you're trying to talk to, your stakeholders, your audience? And if it didn't for some reason, how can you tweak it or improve it, streamline it or simplify it um, in a way that they can get more out of it in the future? Um, so that's what I have, and I'm happy to turn it over for questions now. Um, anybody who wants to get in contact with me, I'm Crumple Jumper on Twitter, or you could uh, find my email on my website and email me as well. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, thanks, Todd. This presentation was really nice, and actually, the homemade materials made it even better. So, thanks yeah. for that. <laughs> I, I think it was a perfect example. I just have like a quick question because I, I talked too much before with uh, Justin and I want you to ask between yourself. And it's 
quite specific. So uh, when I checked this this app, that it's really cool, I, I wondered if you thought about any kind of rim protection measure that doesn't need tracking statistics into account. Like uh, for, I don't know, amateur level here in Spain, is there any way apart from, because blocks uh, and I don't know, blocks per 40 minutes sometimes is not enough. Have you thought about any other alternatives? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I've run into the same issue myself. Either trying to go further back in NBA data where you're kind of pre-tracking era or yeah, going into other leagues where they don't have the same data structure. Um, what can we use to sort of be a surrogate for that rim protection attribute? Um, I think that you can build a model um, that can sort of link that tracking data to what is available across different uh, data sources and try to come up with what you think is going to work best as, as a fill-in. Um, so uh, obviously you mentioned blocks, that works pretty well. Uh, there is from like play-by-play -play data, a more specific version of blocks, which is blocks at the rim. Um, so that gets a little bit closer to um, that tracking level information. Um, also, I mean like, defensive rebounds or specifically defensive rebounds after missed field goals um, is another indicator of like kind of who's standing close to the basket on defense, which is really uh, about as well as that initial bit of data that I'm using is anyways. Because again, I'm not trying to measure the skill of the player as a rim protector, which would involve a, a more thorough analysis, just trying to say like basically, okay, these guys stand close to the basket on defense. Okay, cool. Other questions? Uh, I just to pop in with a suggestion on that in um, kind of the more recent play-by-play uh, -play data, probably from 2000 on for the NBA, um, uh, foul location. Like, uh, first of all, foul rate is probably a decent proxy for, because um, big guys tend to foul more anyway, but like foul foul location is probably also something that like guys who, who get a lot of personal fouls, whether shooting or not, and kind of within X feet of the basket as measured by that, the whatever whatever location on the floor got fat fingered by the <laughs> by the the scorekeeper at the game. So um, that's I think that's another uh, useful proxy that's probably um, somewhat available from last twenty years or so of of, of play by play. Um, my uh, about my question to you is, um, so this is the obviously lineup fit is a big question. Um, is there, have you thought about doing anything to back away from the specificity of five players and looking at um, sort of threshold issues? Okay, to be, if, if a lineup has this much rim protection or a guy who hits this level and a second guy who hits that level or three shooters, but not, but not two or four, or you know what I mean? Like if there's any sort of categorical things like that, that kind of, help you understand because you, you talked about you know a rotation optimizer and it seems like rather than um it's almost some heuristics of you know you're uh, prioritizing what's the most important thing we need rim protection shooting and creation so what's the minimum of each and then do some kind of solver for that does that yeah that's about seven questions in one so <laughs> yeah was a multi -question. yeah so i think uh one part of it uh, that I've been sort of dissatisfied with with the app is that um, because it doesn't use a model, it can have very specific results. Um, so if you plug in a particular combination, it will draw the 50 most similar lineups. And that tends to have a decent size sample, like in the couple thousands of possessions. Um, but that's still not huge, right? So you can have two very similar looking lineups, at least from sort of my perspective. Okay, like these two guys seem like they should be pretty similar if I plug them in to the app with four other sim four other exactly matched guys. But the results end up being like much different. So there, there's like a lack of sort of smoothing out of the information that you get. It's all very specific to whatever that 50 um lineups were that that it pulled out um so it would be nice to have uh 
sort of more like rule of thumb kind of advice to pull from it. Um, one way that I try to do that is by basically just using the app a bunch of times. So like try a bunch of different combinations that can then give you, it's, it's almost like sampling, right? Um, so that you get like a, a range of distribution of outcomes. And then you can say, okay, well, anytime I plug in a guy who is a dynamic wing scorer with these four other players, you know, whether it's wing score A, B, C, or D, I tend to get something that's like plus five or better. So I'm kind of encouraged that if they went after that kind of a player in free agency, that would be a good idea. You know, start to try to round out the edges a little bit and make it a little bit more generalizable. Um, outside of the app, to answer one of the other sub questions there, um, I did try to do uh, a little bit of modeling of different questions like that. So starting with like the most basic question, which might be like, how many bigs should we have on the floor? Um, and sort of seeing like, what's the typical defensive rating, offensive rating and net rating for all these different possible combinations of, you know, strong rim protectors and strong perimeter defenders and anybody else on the court. Um, so I think that is useful to try to get more of like um, something that, that, that can be used as like a target goal for roster construction. Um, and it doesn't come directly from the app, but it's more like uh, trying to play around with the app long enough until you have a sort of philosophy on that. I might answer like two or seven of those. I, I, that, that wasn't great, but uh, <laughs> we could talk more about it too. Okay, Justin. So yeah, so I, I definitely have a question. Um, so to kind of to tag along to Seth's other features that we could think about um, that he mentioned, one feature I'd think about, um, and I think fan-sided, if not Alan Calculus talked about this a few years ago, but uh, regressing shot charts against lineups. If there's a rim protector in there, you'll actually see the shots go away from the rim or the field goal percentages drop dramatically at rim. Um, and I think the one article is from, um, what's his Twitter handle? Uh, Across the Court, he wrote an article about the Hibbert effect with shot charts. So that, you know, there's, there's other proxies that we could try and look into. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's, I believe. Uh, that's Justin Willard, yeah. yeah. And then um, another person who's doing that is uh, Andrew Patton. Um, so he actually just released his updated app that uh, looks at, at just that kind of thing. It's like, um, he calls it um, dis disruption or um, deterrence, I think, deterrence, um, regularized adjusted deterrence. And you can essentially kind of see the impact of a particular defender on the distribution of the shots. And so, like I think his test case was like Joel Embiid, who had this big blue area around the basket where he was really preventing people from attacking the rim at the same rate as they usually would um, and forcing them into more perimeter-oriented attacks. So yeah, I agree, that's a cool idea. Yeah, um, so my question is, uh, so how would you approach uh, role changes in players? So, uh, one of the big questions that I used to have to tackle early on, uh, when, when I say early, like six years ago, this would be anytime I worked with a team, this was like the first question they asked me every time was, can I make player X become player Y? And uh, a key example was, can I turn Serge Ibaka into a three-point shooter? Can I turn Luol Deng from being a high post uh, forward guard combo into a perimeter player that stretches the floor. Um, those are two actual specific players I've been asked about in the past. Um, and the answer is, yeah. And I, I mentioned those two because they did become those guys. Now, for better or worse, Luol had, I think, one good year and not so many good other good years uh, at that role. But how would we, how would I approach this type of idea or this question with that kind of app? Or is it, do I just ignore that question with this app? Yeah, <laughs> yeah unfortunately, uh, probably the latter. Uh, so like I said, the app is not um, forward thinking in the sense that it's projecting a development on any of the players. Um, so it's not saying like, okay, 
yeah, this guy does this, but he's only 23. He could do that next year. Um, it's all just based on the 2019-20 stats in terms of defining where they are in that player space. Um, but you you can visualize – oh, uh, actually, th this is a good – I wanted to bring this up. So the ice cube thing is wrong, right, because they're not – the players aren't frozen in ice. The, the pins can move. It's very fluid, right? And you can actually track – uh, a guy like Brooke Lopez um, for, from Seth's uh, uh, success stories here, um, you can track how he moves through the player space, right? And started um, in one corner uh, with like the purple guys or the pink guys, and then like crossed all the way down into the, the green. Sorry, did you see any of that? Started up here with the purple guys and crossed all the way across the cube. And now is more over here with like the green or the teal group. Um, and, and how do you decide whether that's going to happen with a player is, it, is a tricky question. I think that um, one way to do it is sort of make like to the extent that you can apples to apples comparisons. So you're taking the stats that are relevant to the new role and trying to see how well they're performing in the scenarios where they're doing that role. So Presumably, you're not going to go cold turkey from this guy in role A to next season being something completely different in role B. You've given him at least like a few possessions to try to do this new thing. And you can try to kind of focus on that set of data, I guess, and see how well it's working. So, for example, um, like when Nick Young was moving from the Lakers to the Warriors, his role was going to diminish um, from being a guy who was kind of on the ball and having to create a lot for a really crappy Lakers team to being a totally um, dependent role player who was going to have everything sort of spoon fed for him on the Warriors. So rather than looking at how he performed in the pick and roll, we could look at how he shot, um, you know, off the catch and shoot and in scenarios when he was getting the ball assisted to him um, as a way to sort of make a more realistic evaluation of how he might perform in that role. I think it's a lot harder to do that when the guy's stepping up the role ladder and taking on more ball handling responsibility, for example, um, because you might not have had a chance to really evaluate him in that role much. Um, but I think that there's still a potential to like look at his splits from synergy and say like, okay, how well is he doing in the pick and roll? Is he efficient? Um, and then I think a cool idea, although it's not something that NBA teams seem to be, you know, um, embracing much is like trying to get some of that data from practice and figure out like how effectively people are doing this new role in, in practice scenarios to the extent that you can do that in a realistic way. Um, we, we're actually, uh, Seth and I are kind of involved in this question right now. And we're trying to think about like, basically like breaking down the percentages of success rates for different types of evolution um, in NBA history. So like, how often does a guy go from being a secondary ball handler to a primary ball handler and make that step in a successful transition? Um, so like, I mean, obviously like one thing you could do is just sort of look at the past and see how well it's worked um, previously, but that's not necessarily going to give you a specific answer about whether my guy's going to be able to do it. So that time you asked one question, I gave five answers. So now I'm kind of evening it out a little bit, I think. So uh, gel molds, that's how you, you use I uh, you use the uh, show the player moving through history. He's a jello mold instead of a yeah yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to do a, a resin next time actually. Yeah. Um, so that that actually I'm glad you brought the, brought um, the the sort of the player archetypes thing up because that's that's one of the thing I wanted to ask you as a way to use the app is have you thought of putting any sort of like avatars for. Um, all right, this lineup is pretty good, but we know our small forward isn't a good enough shooter. What happens if we replace him with generic three and D wing profile? What is that? What do yeah. those lineups look like? Have you? I, I noticed when you were looking at the Nuggets one, you you did plug one in with Jermichael Green, um, yeah. but that's but I, I I'm just wondering if that if that helps or exacerbates the kind of the 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 problem of being overly specific. Yeah, no, I think it might. I so right now it's like I said it's all very um, it's 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 looking at specific comparisons between individual players. So you can go in and select 
choose players from all team and then combine your fantasy lineup of any five players. But you can't say put in generic three and D wing other than to pick who you think is a generic three and D wing and put that guy into the lineup. Right. So you can kind of get a sense for like the colors eventually, and then sort of say, okay, I want a green guy in there and plug in a green guy, or I want a purple guy in there and plug in a purple guy. Um, but it's, it's, it's all very like one person. So the only thing that I've done so far to kind of get around that, like I said earlier, is sort of plug in multiple versions of the same type of player and see how wide the results are distributed. If you kind of get a, a sort of zeroing, on, zeroing in on the same answer, no matter which type, which specific version of this type of player you plug in, then you might be kind of thinking, okay, this, this is the right archetype to go after to add to this lineup. But I, I agree that there, there would be a nice, there's a way to do it in a more generalizable way um, with, with modeling rather than have it all be so empirically based where it's just these specific individuals. Awesome. So I think we could discuss for hours, but I don't know if Google Meet has a time limit for recordings. So uh, we switch to Seth's uh, presentation, but it will be the last one. Uh, th thanks for having me. Um, um, Andrea showed at the, at the start, uh, he showed a, a title slide from a, a talk I gave a little over a year ago uh, at the Stats Bomb conference. And this is, if, if people have, uh, have have seen that talk. Uh, apologies in advance because this is this is a uh, a version of, of of similar ideas from that talk. But um, uh, th th this talk is billed as sort of being um, using the language of data, and I actually think I, we should flip that on our head. And it's more about putting data in the language of the sport. I think that is the the single most important lesson I can say uh, as, as as a way of, of communicating uh, these ideas to a, a really a basketball first uh, um, audience. Um, I'm gonna start with the baseball reference because I think this is um, something that is there's there maybe is not really an analog in other sporting cultures, certainly not in uh, a soccer or football cu culture where statistics aren't um, quite as as, uh, as as at the forefront, but um, in, in a baseball is such a, a intrinsic part of kind of American culture that it almost becomes idiom. There are there are aspects of of baseball statistics that 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 carry meaning over and above just the statistic. Um, for example, if you say, "Oh, he's about a three hundred hitter," that means he's pretty good. Um, there isn't maybe a statistical example of that from a, a more of a soccer culture, but I think if you would say that that uh, someone had been red carded, uh, if they were kicked out of a bar or something like that, I think that's a similar idea where it's a uh, a concept from the sport that's so universally understood that it is you don't need any other explanation. You just kind of go with it. Um, and I'll start with a baseball analogy and I'll use an, an anecdote or a saying from another kind of pioneer of baseball um, uh, uh, sabermetrics is a guy named Voris McCracken uh, who came up with some some interesting uh, a lot of interesting stats about um, really credit assignment between players. Um, and he was on stage at the Sloan conference, I want to say about five years ago now. Mm -hmm. And someone asked him a question along the lines of how he communicates. Uh, and his answer, I thought, was very perceptive. He was he's like, you know, I don't do statistics. I don't do analytics. I don't do computer science. I don't do programming. I do baseball. Um, and so that's, again, if we're, if, we're, if we're talking about statistics to solve basketball problems, we need to ask and answer the question in the language of basketball, because that way we all sort of are talking about the same thing. And I think um, the, the, the underlying point of this talk is to really examine uh, the properties of language so that we can go about uh, using our statistics in a way that we can maximize the communicative the communicative uh, impact um, when when you know talking to people who maybe aren't as data familiar but are very much subject matter expertise in the field of basketball. So um, and another thing that that has that is I think permeated a lot of both Justin and Todd's talks is um, Perfection is often the enemy of the good. Um, 
you know, we're not trying to solve everything at once. Um, you know, Justin, I think, talked about, you know, the, the dangers of throwing everything into a model. Uh, it might be perfectly predictive, but so what? Because you can't explain anything. We're trying to add more and more um, over time so our understanding becomes better and better. So we make better decisions. We're not going to get them all right. This is hard. If it was easy, you wouldn't need to use statistics to, to better understand the game. So we're, we're really, it's an iterative process that we're, we're trying to get better. We're trying to chip away at the unknown. Um, that to answer, you know, again, Adrian's question at the start, are these small gains worth it? Absolutely. Because you make a small gain today and a small gain tomorrow and you do, you, you get a little bit better every day and you, un, and you look back in two weeks or a month and you understand much more. It's the same thing. You don't, you don't go from the first day of, of training camp to, ready for the playoffs in one day, you, you build slowly. Um, and it's, it's no different here. Um, so I think some of this is self-explanatory, but the, the, the motivating question here is why does language matter? Um, it, 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 there's a sense of accuracy, um, being talking about what you mean to be talking about, communicating the idea that you are hoping hoping to address. Um, it, Justin spent a lot of time talking about interpretability. Um, it's not just an idea to have a number on a page that has to have uh, an impact, uh, uh, whether it's a decisional impact or evaluative Im impact or a predictive impact uh, to help better understand the problem you're addressing. Um, you know, the, the concept of fidelity means that it uh, a piece of language has to mean sort of the same thing whenever you use it. Um, if, if two people are using the same term, uh, and this is very frequently a problem in, in both basketball and basketball statistics, but you end up arguing about the meaning of terms rather than using the same term to communicate kind of a, a shared idea. And, 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 and so, and, and the point again is, is communicating the, the answer to the question that you're trying to answer. Um, from a linguistic standpoint, this is, this is uh, kind of what the, what the, what language, uh, the, the, the properties of spoken written language um, are. Um, there, there's six of them here. We're going to mostly focus on the first couple. Um, the, the first one is, is it's known as arbitrariness. Um, words don't have intrinsic meaning. They are given meaning, and it's sort of a, a shared agreement that that meaning applies to everybody. Um, there's a degree of, of, of cultural transmission. So there's, there's ideas that go behind um, the word that that are, are brought with the word in, in ever, uh, whenever it's used. Um, uh, d discreteness is, is it, it, it's, it's exclusionary. If, 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 uh, if a word or term means one thing, it does not mean another. Um, and, and displacement is a similar, a similar concept uh, to that. Uh, duality just means that it's the spoken and, and written terms are, are the same thing. So a symbol on a page and a sound are the same kind of object. And the last one, which I think gets back to the idea of getting a little bit better every day is, is productivity. That means you can take a word, you can take a phrase, you can, you can take multiple words, form a phrase, form a sentence, form a paragraph. And these, these small blocks of meaning can be combined into larger blocks of meaning. Now that's, that's a little bit meta to start the talk, but I just wanted to sit, sort of set the framework of, of, of why this is important. Um, you know, much like words, uh, statistics are arbitrary, um, by, you know, I would maybe say all are arbitrary, really almost all statistics are arbitrary. Um, you, uh, you know, the, the scoreboard is, is objective. Uh, the, the ball goes in the basket or it doesn't, uh, you get points or you don't. Um, and the, the standings table is like, you've won the game or, or, or you've lost, but they are useful representa uh, representative uh, abstractions. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into a rebound. 
Um, there's a, you know, it's a, uh, a defensive rotation that leads to a contested shot that leads to a missed shot. Someone boxes out, someone grabs the rebound. We say a rebound as pe- knowledgeable basketball people, we understand all of that goes into the rebound, but for ease of use, we just call it a rebound and say that player who ended up with the ball, he got the rebound knowing that all these other actions were sort of part of recovering the basketball after it was shot and bounced off the rim. Um, I think that, uh, again, Justin, despite, you know, talking in, in very uh, uh, um, complex terms about modeling, I think he, he t- hit on this as well. The, again, the importance of interpretability. A lot of what we're, we're, we're looking at is defining things, um, which means we're not necessarily in, in interested in building hugely complex models. We are interested in understanding the events as they happen in the game. Um, you've, you've talked about uh, the, the rookie data pipeline. If you go too far afield too fast with modeling and ignore kind of the fundamental blocks of basketball that people know, uh, you're you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, as Justin said, you know, people are going to look at the, are going to look at the picture, ask what it means. That's all they're going to, that's all they're going to understand. Um, so having the, the description of what you want to know contained in that is of vital importance. Um, and kind of the counterpoint uh, is um, you, you get into these black box methods and you lose interpretability. I think, um, uh, I strongly agree with Justin that I will sacrifice a little bit of, of precision for interpretability every single time um, because we need to know why something happens as much as knowing what. Um, so let, let's get into the idea of, of, of cultural transmission. Um, naming. Naming stats is of vital importance to, to helping, um, to, to helping that understanding. Um, the more the name of a stat can tell you what it is without need of further uh, further uh, explanation, the better off you are. Um, some of the 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 bad uh, the bad ones on the right, those are some terms from hockey that essentially just mean shot share. Um, but because they're named after people or an acronym that doesn't actually stand for anything, in the case of BDO, um, there's been a lot of of uh, barrier to uptake of those stats just because what's a Corsi? Well, if you, if you said, well, we took three more shots than they did and taking more shots is good. That's much easier to understand, but because it's, it's sort of been named poorly, it's the things get in the way. Um, even in basketball stats, like sometimes the, the, the name gets in the way. I think at this point, people who have studied the four factors recognize what offensive rating is. I think even that, puts up a little bit of a barrier because just the word rating sort of implies a certain degree of, uh, of evaluation that's going on when really it's just a, it is a wholly objective measure of points per possession points per hundred possession. Um, when you, when you remove that evaluative aspect from the name, it becomes, uh, much, uh, less threatening. Um, and obviously we, uh, you know, talked earlier about, about uh, you know words having specific meaning, um, naming things in sort of confusingly ambiguous ways or or adjacent ways has a way of uh, of confusing people, uh, and obviously like um, putting too much salesmanship in your uh, metrics name um, certainly to me is a red flag. You start talking about like uh, impact metrics or grades, and I, just, I start to to wonder you know if you're trying to sell me something and rather than trying to communicate something with me and that sort of instantly puts someone's guard up for for disbelieving what you what you have to say um so the here's an example of the importance of of having uh, you know discrete defined meetings um in in basketball uh more than perhaps any other sport um single players have massive impact on the team success. And it's because uh, unlike, you know, basically any other sport, if you have the best player on the floor, you can give him the ball every time. 
And if he has an advantage, he can make something good happen. Maybe not every time, but at a much higher volume than I think is possible in any other sport. So it's demonstrated at, at the NBA level, at, at other pro levels, that you need superstars to win. Great. What's a superstar? Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe the amount of of kind of of argument that one might have about whether you're talking about a top five player, a top fifteen player. Um, I can just I, I can tell you from an empirical standpoint the difference between the uh, fifth best player and the fifteenth best player in the NBA is larger in terms of of championship impact is l- probably larger than the difference between the fifteenth and thirty fifth best player. Um, just because as you go up the ladder, it, it is it, it's uh, the returns to being the best guy are, are are that are that strong. So what this means is it's really important to if we're talking about hey we need a superstar. What does that mean? Um, he, this is if, if someone has read my my uh, piece on, on NBA tiers. This is kind of comes out of the research from that, and it's it, it the the curve kind of demonstrates the the presumed impact on winning a championship of players as you know a single season production go. And you can you can see that uh, that again the the better a player goes, there's an, an increasing level of of uh, likelihood that they that they uh, impact winning a championship. And so you want to ma- really make sure that when you're talking about a franchise superstar, you're talking about one of those guys in orange. Um, and and having everyone use that same set of terms in discussion is is it saves so much time uh, in in arguments and 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 decision decision making. Um, a- another kind of um, similar idea is, uh, coming out of tracking data is, um, you know, if you're evaluating your your offense or defense, you're looking at a, at the process. Are we generating good shots? Well, what's a good shot? Uh, as I asked Justin earlier, like, um, you know, it's not really a binary. This is a good shot. This is a bad shot. But for the purpose of evaluation, uh, we can't we we can't give kind of a continuous distribution. We have to do a little bit of binning here. Um, what what is what is good, what is bad? So at a glance, we can kind of uh, do some quick evaluation. Now, um, for various reasons, uh, on three pointers, uh, NBA.com lists uh, uh, three pointers as taken at, at various degrees of pressure. Thusly, uh, with the, the the ways on the left, um, I don't particularly like that naming convention just because if you look at it, if you if you uh, call the, the the two widest bins of space the open shots, that means ninety percent of of NBA three pointers are open, um, and especially as teams become more and more willing to take lightly contested three pointers, I I think that is. Uh, this collapsing meaningful difference rather than explaining things. Whereas if you just looked at open shots at those with at least six feet of space, all of a sudden looking, you know, back to the last full season we had in 2018, 19, it's about 50, 50. And, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here, but I feel like that does a better job of explaining when shots are contested and when they aren't among the shots that are actually taken. Um, So, uh, again, uh, calling the, the 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 shots open or contested on the the bottom uh, heuristic is, I think, a better way of communicating uh, that sort of information rather than than kind of the one size fits all that you know. In, in shots around the rim, um, the the this this uh, taxonomy makes sense, but the longer the shot goes, the the less it does. Um. Um, I, I talked about this earlier. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because uh, I think Todd especially has has uh, done some really good demonstration on sort of visual communication, both uh, in his presentation earlier, but also even his Twitter feed daily. Um, so uh, just to to reemphasize his point that that some people prefer uh, you know verbiage, some people prefer visuals, and 
um, getting in the habit of communicating things uh, in, in multiple ways is, is very useful to make sure that everyone's coming with you as an audience. Um, I, I will say though that, uh, that you know, pronounceable words and names uh, are your friends to, to again, if, when speaking, making sure it's understood that everyone is understanding uh, what is being discussed. Um, and kind of the, the, the final point I, I wanna hit on is again, we are building, taking small blocks that are stats, that are language, uh, and we can combine them together to build greater understanding and um, help people like build up and flex stronger and stronger analytical muscles as they take the the small pieces whether it's the you know what is a possession what is a what is uh what is a chance what what does offensive rating mean uh and then you can start to build up um you know some descriptive measures about like what causes uh, offensive rating to go up and build up and build up to get a, a deeper and deeper understanding of the game with each level of, of complexity you introduce, um, that doesn't actually seem like more complexity because the the first things that you've learned now have become so internalized that you just they, they, it just has a it has a piece of shared meaning that doesn't need to be explained anymore. Um, an example I would like to use here is is kind of you you might have a a theory of of offensive player value and it's it's you know it's this this you might you might put a a a measure this way that that it's just a, a sum of a player's shot selection shot making playmaking gravity offensive rebound and movement that's broadly speaking the activities a player can can uh, create an offense as of right now we have pretty good understanding of shot selection and shot making so we've got a partial understanding of this value however if we if we learn a good way to measure a player's gravity all of a sudden we can add that in and now we have a even a better solution to player value because we can add that new piece of understanding to what we have already learned uh, uh, previously um so I, I know we'd gone long in in the first couple so i kind of uh, blazed through that a little bit to uh to get some questions, but uh, you know, you can read me at the Athletic. Uh, I'm at Seth Partner on Twitter, or shoot me an email if you need to. Thanks for the talk, Seth. Uh, yes. It's really clear, nice, and I think it's it's really helpful for I don't know all all those guys that want to be uh, analysts to have these things clear. And I, I agree with you, and I think that the main issue is to ask the right questions to coaches to then get insights of the things you want. Then I have one main question. I think it's not completely related to the topic, but I, I'm just cu curious somehow. Is that who are you communicating with? And second questions, because we are here doing meta questions all the time. So at some point do you think that you can communicate somehow with players to talk about uh numbers things so um i i, I want to address the, the first comment you made first is um a, a good a, a big part of that communication with coaches is um oftentimes coaches will try to ask you a statistical question and i would encourage anyone who's doing you know basketball stats work to like politely but say no don't don't ask a stats question ask a basketball question let me figure out the stats and then i will give it back to you in basketball rather than because you know, as you know coaches get more familiarity with data they'll, they'll have some understanding of what's out there so they'll try to you know if you if you go to a country where you know five words of the language, you might know how to ask to go to the bathroom, but you don't, <laughs> that doesn't mean you can actually have a conversation. Um, and so that that's kind of where uh, a, a neophyte in data will find themselves in those conversations. So so meet them where they live rather than, than the other way around. Um, and in terms of, I think your question is, is do you um, alter your your what you're talking about based on your audience is that yeah absolutely um 
you know, I think that the, the way I would discuss these things with Justin is is completely different than than I would with with a with a basketball coach. And and I mean, Justin is sort of unique in this regard, um, just because he actually has high level playing experience, also. So someone you can talk to on a on a you know uh, has has sort of an intrinsic understanding of basketball as a sport, but also the statistical methods, but even someone who did not have that kind of playing background. Yeah. You would talk to someone very differently if you are, you know, worrying about, you know, which, which model to use, what, you know, what algorithm to select to address a particular problem than you would a basketball coach who wants to know about pick and roll coverages. Um, and you have to, I mean, the, the, the same principles of communication hold, but the subject matter is just different. Um, again, in, in that more technical conversation, you have the basketball part in the back of your mind, but you are talking technique now, not kind of uh, not X's and O's as much. Um, and as your last question about communicating with players, we're largely not there yet. Um, the experience of baseball might or might not be instructive here. Um, just because there's a lot of differences. Uh, baseball is a very stop-start game. Uh, so there's a lot of discrete events and like study has sort of always been part of that culture. Um, and now we're kind of two or three generations of players into the sabermetric movement. So baseball players coming up today, a lot of them have grown up with this stuff. And so they're as, as interested in hearing about it as, as, um, you know, kind of the, the the front office types or the coach types might might be um, that we're new enough in it in basketball that that hasn't really happened yet. Um, I think we're still a ways away from it, um, especially as kind of stuff like um, you know shot tracking software is just really starting to percolate into lower levels. Whether it's you know the kinds of of systems you can like put on the basket and it'll give you instant feedback on you know, your shot was two inches to the left of dead center or something like that. Um, that's stuff like that is becoming more common. Um, more and more players seem to be as they're like taking, making use of the public data that's available and having some understanding of, of kind of what sort of actions are entailed by a different role. Um, but I think we're still probably a decade or more away from it being really widespread. And then there's just the difficulty of because basketball is such a dynamic game, um, any discussion you have with a player that introduces conscious thought on the court is bad. Um, because you could do the right thing, but if it doesn't happen like that, it's too late. And that's, you know, so it's much more of working through a coaching filter. I'm still much more comfortable with that. Um now, whether how to kind of step one is putting players in positions on the court so their kind of learned tendencies on the court lead them to analytically good actions. And maybe step two is doing some training so that in situations on the court, you, you alter those behaviors to lead to analytically good outcomes where, you know, Oh, if I if I if I don't take one step inside this line, the shot is worth one more point. Like that's something that has to be practiced, and then it becomes automatic. Um, so I think that answers your questions completely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the first question answered that it's like uh, asked and and answered at the same time with with no sub questions or sub answers. Thanks. I, I don't know if you have other questions. So I, I got one It'll yeah. kind of piggyback off the last one. Um, in, in the years that I've been doing this, I, I think I've directly talked to a player about stats, maybe four, four different players, <laughs> once or twice. And uh, there's, there's more than just the player consciousness. There's the, you know, some of the players are heading into contract years and they're more interested in their stats. And that might be counterproductive for the team because they might start doing things that the coaching staff doesn't want them to do because they're thinking about next year already. So there's, there's a lot more dynamic just off the court as well. Um, and uh, um, when I do, when I used to present to like coaches, um, 
the only times I talked to coaches immediately was if they're like, hey, hotshot, bring this report in now. I want to talk to you about something. You know, there was never a, uh, you know, a, a formalized reporting system. It was always, uh, we're interested in this question. And then nine times out of 10, or I should really say 99 times out of 10, uh, I would go and talk to the video guys first and be like, okay, what, like, I can have this conversation with you because I'm trying to break down exactly what he means. Because sometimes a, a coach will come out to me and say, you know, tell me something about this. And I'll be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then I'll go decipher that later. Um, so there is a lot of communication that goes on. And, I, and, and when I had these roles, I was mostly a consultant or I would be on site for small portions of the year uh, up, up to full time um, working directly with staff. Um, and I found that approximately 40% of my time was communication and 60% was was actual analysis. And even of that 60%, 50% of that was translation um, and, and understanding, both in the reverse, forward and reverse ways. And Seth has had uh, a much more distinguished p position where that I, I just imagine the communication role is even greater. And um, I know when you started with Milwaukee, it was a much smaller shop. Um, so this, this number might be skewed because of the amount of personnel that was there at the time. But what kind of percentages did you do you find yourself at the higher levels where you're doing that direct communications with general managers or coaching staff or video guys? Like what what type of percentage of, of your time is dealt with just the language aspect as opposed to the the nitty gritty analytic aspect? Um, certainly, as as it became you know as as I had um, people to <laughs> do do some of the, the the actual you know coding and stuff for me, that became the bulk of of really of of um, the I would say the translation and communication, like taking the basketball and it, like the translation does involve some kind of exploratory data analysis, like where you know you're. You know, you're you're talking about you know you're you're looking at the 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 the, the ball screen incident. You're looking at like there's a there's there's a lot of classification issues that kind of is this this or is this that, and that's you know yeah you you probably because they're the people who have time to really you know get into the nitty gritty of that question with you. Yeah, that's that's the 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 film the film room the scouts the the film scouts are the guys who who or guy uh, primarily guys um, that that. Uh, are really the, the best people to make sure that, you know, the situation you're analyzing is the situation that's being asked about. Um, but yeah, no, I would say that kind of the, the latter bit of my time in Milwaukee, was, I would say between two thirds and three quarters of the time was in that sort of translation communication rather than sort of, um, you know, active on like active on my part um data work or you know even mm, again that's it, like where the line between data work you know it, it, it's very it, like the, the, like again because the the exploratory analysis is such an important part of the translation that right. where that stops but in terms of actual like higher level modeling it was probably like that that was the, the sort of the rump of, of what i was working on as compared to the communication and translation cool thanks seth do you have a particular um stat name that you actually ran into issues or wish you wish from the start it had been renamed to something else um, I, the offensive rating is the big, first of all, there's the, the multiple offensive ratings. There's the, there's, there's sort of the basketball reference Dean Oliver version, which is a, which is sort of a, a an, an interesting, um, attempt at, at sort of a holistic offensive measurement from bef really from before we had even good play-by-play -play data. Um, and there's it's some interesting things that, that is trying to pull out kind of latent information that we can directly measure now first with play-by-play -play data and now with, with with tracking data as opposed to kind of the the more um commonly understood like points per 100 but even the points per 100 i think we would have been better off if we had just called it points per 100 like points scored per 100 points allowed per 100 differential per 100 we would have been just better off because that that like that that what that is is there's no there's no you know doubt about that and it, it's you've completely removed any sort of um 
I'm judging you aspect of it because it's what happened. Like, okay, there's, there's reasons it happened. We know that. But like when we were on the court, this happened. When this group was on the court, that, that happened. Um, and that's just a, that's a much better place to start from than something where it even appears like as a semi outsider, you're substituting your judgment for the, you know, the long tenured expert, whether it's the player or a coach or something like that. Um, so that's a, that's a big example. Um, other examples are hustle stats, um, because hustle is is a word that has such like positive connotations that's like, like anything that shows up as a hustle stat is sort of given a uh, a glow of goodness because it's you're hustling, you're doing this. And that may or may not be true, but it's just it it's it it, it just by that that applying that label to it, it it gives it it you know it it makes it seem like exalted in a way that I that to the that I'm not sure empirically some of those stats screen assists uh warrant. So um th- those are off the top of my head, those are those are those are two big ones. But I, by the way, I don't I don't I don't think that the things being tracked in hustle stats are bad things to track. I just think calling them hustle stats is problematic because again you know, giving it the old college try kind of thing makes so. Okay, so uh, I can't believe it, but I think we are done with the questions and <laughs> presentations. So I, I just hope that everyone enjoyed these talks. Certainly, I, I've been enjoying this like a lot. I, I I wrote a lot of notes, and I will have to check it twice or three times maybe. So I don't know, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Justin. Th- thanks, Todd. Thanks, Seth. Um, I just hope to see you on Twitter uh, around and if COVID ends and we can have uh, slow conferences, uh, meet you there at some point. So thanks, guys, and see you around. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Enjoy it. Bye, guys.